fifth grade and below, sorry. <coughs> the rest of you have to stay in here with If you have your Bibles, we are in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we are in verses 16 through 20 this morning. Last call for children. <laughs> well, the past few weeks, months, maybe month now, we have been in the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel according to Mark. We started in verse 1, chapter 1, and we made it all the way to verse 16, and today we'll make it all the way to verse 20. Uh, you know, we end up in church, we end up talking a lot about Jesus, we talk a lot about sometimes theology or doctrine or what God is like or what heaven is like or what the church should be like, but very rarely do we ever just read about Jesus himself. Self. Read about his life, read about his words, read about his ministry, how he came to be, what he says, what he might think is important. So that's why we have gone to the book of Mark to give a first-hand account of the life of Jesus Christ. We started in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, in the beginning. Mark says this is the beginning of the gospel, this is how I see the gospel, this is how I see it begins. Other Gospels start in different areas, but Mark chose this place. He learned about John the, the Baptist, or John the Baptizer came in the wilderness, and he was baptizing folks, teaching them about a baptism of repentance. And he kept saying, there's going to be one come after me that's better and stronger and more mightier, and he's going to baptize you with not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus shows up. Mark goes from one to the next. He's telling his story in his version. He wants us to see that Jesus is not just a man that came to earth, that Jesus is not just a good old boy that walked around in sandals and didn't cut his hair and told good stories. He wants you to know that Jesus is God, and he shows us this over and over and over. So sometimes he may leave some details out, but his version of the story, he has a purpose and a point. We saw Jesus get baptized by John. We heard the voice of God says, You are my beloved Son, in whom you, I am well pleased. We saw the dove come down in the form of the Holy Spirit. We saw all three versions of God all in one spot. The Father in heaven, the Son getting baptized, and the Holy Spirit coming down. The Trinity, the triune God, all in one spot. Immediately after his baptism, it says the Spirit, the same Spirit that came and landed on him, drove him out into the wilderness, further out into the boondocks, to be tempted by Satan, where he spent 40 days with the devil after him, starving, fasting, being tempted to turn rocks into bread, tempted to throw himself from a temple so the angels would catch him, tempted to have all the kingdoms given to him if he would just bow down to Satan, and he refused all of them by using the word of God. So Mark is taking us through these very fast glimpses of Christ, and then he leaves the wilderness and comes back to Galilee in verse uh, 14. We did last week, 14 and 15. It says, now after John was put into prison, Jesus comes back to Galilee. Last week I mentioned that a year had passed between verse 13 and 14 that we really don't see here. But if you look at the Gospel of John, it does tell us some events that happened in between there. And here we are. Jesus has come and came back to Galilee because the prophets had foretold that. He come back to Galilee. He has set up his headquarters in Capernaum, which is by the Sea of Galilee. And that's where we find us today. He was baptized. He went to the wilderness. He went away. And now he's back in Galilee preaching. And that's where we pick up verse 16. So Mark chapter 1, verse 16 says... And as he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. Verse 17, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. 
When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants, and went after him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much again for this morning. Thank you for this time that we're able to spend together, Lord. But thank you for this word. Thank you for this testimony you've given us through Mark. Thank you for this story, Lord. I pray that we, we get every ounce of, of detail out of this that we can and apply it to our lives and not just walk away with a better knowledge of some story that happened 2,000 years ago, but life-changing stories that will help us change our life for the better and follow you even better. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here we have in verse 16 through 20, Jesus is calling his first disciples. He's kind of been on his own, but now he's making his little pack. He's calling his first disciples. And we can divide this section, the 16 through 20, and actually into two different ones. We can see that he called two guys and then went a little further and called two other guys. And the, the passages are so similar. If you have your Bible, you can see it a lot better than if you just put one verse up here at a time. But the first two verses, verse 3, 16, 17, and 18, uh, Jesus calls the two guys, and then 19 and 20, he calls two others. So I'll break it down into just two different things. But he's doing the same thing each time. And I want you to see this in verse 16 and 19. Jesus saw men working. He simply saw men working in verse 16. He saw Simon and Andrew in verse uh, 19. He had gone a little farther and he saw them. And then 17 and 20, he calls both of them. So not only does he see them working, but then he calls them. And then in both stories, they both left everything and followed him. So basically, they're identical stories. We just have a couple of different names in the pile. In the first section, we have Simon, who later becomes Peter and Andrew. This is the same Simon that walked on water. This is the same Simon that denied Jesus in the end. That ended up being the preacher in Acts. The same Simon that wrote 1 and 2 Peter in the New Testament. And his brother says Andrew, his brother. Andrew, we don't know a lot of famous stuff about Andrew, but we do know he's the brother of Peter. And in the next section, we have a couple of name brands, one name brand and another brother. We've got John. This is John, the beloved disciple. This is John who wrote the Gospel of John. This is the John that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelations. This is when he starts to follow Christ. Right here, this is the very beginning of his ministry, of his life of following Christ. So this is a very pivotal point when Jesus starts building his kingdom by using the disciples. And then we have James. Now, this is not the James that wrote the book of James, but another James. There's lots of James. But this is just another James. So here we have the account of Christ calling these men, and two of them, we know, became very big influences in the New Testament, in the new church, in the beginning. Now, I did mention earlier that a year had passed since Jesus was tempted and when he came back. And if we go to John chapter 1, the same guy that was called, he wrote the book. If we go over there and look, we can see that Peter and John, this was probably not, I mean, Peter and Andrew, this was probably not the first time. John actually says that they had met him before. And I'm just giving you all this as a background because it helps us understand the story. But also, we need to understand the size of this area that Jesus was in, and it, and it won't be any surprise that they probably had ran into. Because did you know the Sea of Galilee is only about the size of Lake Livingston? We think sea like Gulf of Mexico, but this is just a lake. And Madison County is bigger than the whole area that they're in, including the Sea of Galilee. So it's no surprise that these guys probably have ran into each other before. They probably knew and saw Jesus walking around that they had actually met Jesus when John was baptizing. But it's no big deal. But I want you to start to understand how these guys were connected. And the kind of the size of the area, if you took the two maps, you would see how small the area really was. Because they, they walked everywhere they went, right? I hope it was a small area. So we know this is not the first time they had met. 
But here we are. We're back in Galilee. We're headquartered at Capernaum. Jesus is walking around, and he's starting to call them to follow him. It's time. <coughs> Just like he preached last time, the time is fulfilled. Repent. <coughs> believe in the gospel. He's saying it's time. It's time for the kingdom to start, for the ministry to begin. You know, a simple summary of this passage of 6 through 20, we could just say, Jesus sees the people, he calls the people, and they follow him. And it's that simple. There's nothing else really to say, but he sees us, he calls us, we leave, and we follow. And that's what these men did. So let's look at verse 16. In your notes, Jesus saw men working. <coughs> You fill in the blank on the working, but that's really not the most important part. The most important is Jesus saw them. Circle saw, because that's probably the word that should have been in underline. The verb, saw. Jesus saw these people. What kind of people does Christ call? <coughs> Let's look at these men. Let's look at, see what kind of people Jesus really calls. This passage shows us that Christ calls ordinary folks, ordinary fishermen, Ordinary workers. I mean, look where he called them. He called them on the side of the, of the Sea of Galilee. They were fishing. They were working. They were at the marina. Anybody ever been to the marina? It's not the nicest place. Probably smells like dead shrimp, right? That's where these guys were. Just ordinary guys. They were not in a religious <coughs> center. They were not in a university. They were not in a church. They were just ordinary, hardworking men that Jesus called to follow him. They were not in a position of authority. They were not in a position of power, nor did they possess any kind of certain wealth. They had nothing but their boats and their nets. They didn't have this huge thing of financial security. They were out in the everyday workplace like we are every day also. They were just normal men, just like we are. Jesus called the simple. They were not the religious leaders, the powerful, the wealthy. They weren't there. They were just like us. You know, actually the truth is that positions and powers and wealth and security and religion and learning all someone away from God. We sometimes think we're not worthy, we're not smart enough, but most of those things that I have labeled will actually keep you away from God because it can make you so self-confident in yourself we have no need of God. We put our reliance and our trust in ourselves and our abilities and our money and our wealth and our education and our ideas. There's not much room for God. Now, I like to read these satire jokes, and there's one I came across with the other day. And it said, well, why should I look forward to heaven when America is so great? But how true is that? We live in the best country in the world, and if you don't believe, just go take a little tour. We live in the best country of the world. We live in the best state. We live in the best county. Amen? Amen. But sometimes it's so great we think, well, what do I need of God? I've got everything I need. So these things can actually get in our way. God is unable to work his power as long as we are in control of the power and as long as we think we're smart enough or good enough or wealthy enough or healthy enough to do it. We have to realize that we need God. They were not just unimportant, but they were also industrious and hardworking. Both, all four of the men were working. They were fishing. They were men in their nets. They were working. They were doing something. It says they saw Simon and Andrew casting in the net. In other words, were mending the nets. They were doing something. See, Jesus has no room for the lazy. He has no room for the nonchalant, the disinterested, the uncommitted, the unfaithful, he doesn't have any place for them. He needs people that will work for his kingdom, that will build his kingdom. That's what he calls. He needs people that are industrious, people that will invest their life to his kingdom, not invest their life in their own kingdom. That's the ones he calls, not to waste their life. Another point that I kind of thought about is these disciples were also cooperative. Think about it. These were brothers working together. Anybody ever worked with their family? <laughs> they must be cooperative. Two of them working with their dad. But they were cooperative. They were industrious. They were hardworking. They were cooperative. 
And lastly, they were visionary. You know how I know they were visionary? Because they were looking for something else. They were looking for something better. They knew something else better must be out there. God can call anyone. And he will call anyone. And he does call everyone. But we have to be willing. We have to be looking. We have to be willing to put aside whatever it is and go after him. There has to be more. Have you ever felt that way? No matter what you've accomplished, you feel like there's got to be more. There's got to be more to this. I finally got this thing that I've been waiting on and it's still not enough. They probably caught boatloads of fish and figured out it still wasn't enough. Me and my friend, uh, Dean Ferguson, we love to go white bass fishing in the spring. We go to Richland Chambers, Somerville, Lake Twelve. you know, when they're schooling, the limit's 25 for a person, but who's counting? <laughs> we, just catch, we get the catch and release. Is that thing on? <laughs> we do the catch and release. You know, like, if we catch a little bit bigger, we will put that one in the box and throw one out. There we go. But what I'm saying is, is we always just want one more. <laughs> and it's getting dark. One more fish. And it's never enough. That's the way we live our lives. One more, it's never enough. And I bet these guys were fishermen like me, and they probably always wanted one more. But they were looking. They said, there has to be something more. Because this one more fish thing ain't cutting it. The main ingredient here is we have to be available and willing to respond, and my question to you this morning is, are you looking for something more? We're all looking for something more, but are you looking in the right place? These men were. They recognized his voice. They knew something extraordinary was there, and they followed. <clears throat> the second part in your notes, Jesus calls men to follow him. Your right hand is follow, but circle the word calls. He sees us. And he calls us. He calls us to follow him. These men were called by Christ. They were called to follow him. And they were to immediately follow him. The point is this. As a disciple, we should be following Christ. Personally attaching ourselves to, them, to him. We like to follow all kinds of things. We follow famous bloggers. We follow football teams, we follow Facebook people, we follow the socialites, whatever we follow, but we must follow Christ. We must attach ourselves to him. That's his call. He says, follow me. I've said this before. He said it over here in all the world of the junk. Follow me. I'm here. The thing you want here. Not all of that out there. Before we can do anything else for Christ, we must attach ourselves to him. We must follow him. Before we can do anything for him, we must learn about him. We must learn to serve him. We must learn about him. We must build that relationship to him before we can follow him. In your notes, he, he calls us to a task. He calls us to become like him. To do work. Circle become. Circle to do. He calls us so we can become like him. To do his work. Many of us love to be students. We love to be disciples. We love to go to church, Sunday school, and sign me up for every Bible study I can get. I want to learn all this stuff. But there's a reason we learn. There's a reason we become like him, so we can continue his work. We can do his work. That's the whole purpose. He doesn't need a big school. He needs a big group of workers. Jesus didn't come to build a university. He came to build a kingdom says follow me so you can become like me so you can do my work because I'm going back and I'm going to send a helper and you're going to do greater things than I did that's what he wants us to do these men were called by Christ they were called to another work this was a call to a different kind of a employment it was drastic it was traumatic it was a change but remember the call to a personal relationship had already been issued. We already learned in John that they probably already knew Jesus. We know that they met. We know they walked around a little bit. If you go back and read First John, I mean John chapter 1. We know they had that relationship. We have to build that relationship with Christ before we can become like him. We must follow him. We must build that relationship. 
before we can serve him. Many in today's churches, we are trying to serve him without a relationship. We serve him because it's what we're supposed to do. We serve him because our wife makes us, or we serve him because our husband tells us, or the preacher tells us, or we saw our mama do it, or whatever it is, we serve him. But we don't have a relationship with him. He doesn't even know our name. But we're serving him. He says, you have to come. You've got to know me. I want to know you. Then we become like him. Then we can do his work. Most of us are just mechanically doing what we think we are supposed to do. Doing it in our own strength. Hoping someone else will recognize it. <coughs> hoping God will recognize it in the end and give us some kind of credit or check mark in the end. We must know him personally. He must know our name. We must know his name. We must know what he has done for us. I serve Christ not because I'm supposed to, but because of what he has done for me. I love because he first loved me. Amen. We respond with serving. We respond with following. It's not an order. It's a response. When the creator of the universe says, follow me, you should want to follow him. There's nothing better to follow. It doesn't exist. Many of us serve him because we think it's what we're supposed to do. Also, he's calling us, he's calling them to fish for men. This was a call to service. It was a call to care for other people, to minister to other people's needs. There is no greater call than the people business. There's also no more frustrating call than the people business. Anybody work retail? <laughs> but there's no greater call than souls, eternal lives. There's nothing else on this planet worth more than another person's soul. Nothing more important on this planet than where another person will spend eternity. No greater call can come but the people business. Think of the things that we give ourselves daily to. Think of all the things that we give ourselves every day to. We give ourselves to our jobs. We give ourselves to our Playtime. We give ourselves to all of these other things that more than likely are wasted. All the hours we spend for ourselves. What if we took just a few of those hours and applied them to the kingdom of God? Just a few. What would it be like? But we always spend our time on ourselves. God is calling us called them to fish for men. He is calling us into ministry. And lastly, the call was to be immediate and total attachment to Christ, a total detachment from the world and attached to Christ. Now, many believe that this means they must quit their job. Oh, Christ, I don't want to follow him. I'm going to have to go in Monday and quit my job. I don't believe that's what he's doing today. These guys, Jesus showed up at their job and said, follow me. If Jesus showed up and I knew it was him, now if somebody else showed up and said that, I would say, no, man, i got to go back to work. Thanks. But if I knew it was Christ, I would follow him. But he's not here physically anymore. He's not asking you to quit your job tomorrow, get on welfare, and walk around Mount with some sandals. He's not telling you to do that. He's telling you to keep your job and change who you work for. That's where we should be. You are right now, right today, in this very spot, in your home, in your job, and where you're sitting today, right where God wants you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And he's calling you to follow him. He doesn't want us to change occupations. He just wants you to change who you're working for. All those hours spent building your kingdom, he wants you to build his. Keep your job. Instead of working for ourselves, work for Jesus. We should change who we're working for. There's nothing complicated about keeping our current job and detaching ourselves from it and attaching ourselves to Christ unless you're in an illegal job. Then quit your job <laughs> and follow Christ and get you a better job. But Jesus knows we need to make a living. He knows we need to feed our family. 
But he says, change who you're working for. Change why you're doing it. You see, Christ will adapt a person's call to their situation. He will adapt your call to your knowledge and your experience. Guess who he called to be fishers of men? Fishermen. And he just says, hey, you're catching fish every day. Let me show you how to catch men. He will call you to your calling that fits your job, that fits your personality, that fits your traits, right where you are. He will call you to that. He's not going to call you to quit your job and become a fisherman. <coughs> He's going to use you for who you are. And that should stir some confidence. God is not going to ever call you to do anything he hasn't prepared you to do. Or giving you the strength to do it. You can still be a clerk. You can still be a banker. You can still be a rancher. You can still be a stay-at-home mom. You can still be a construction worker. You can still be retired and work for Jesus Christ. Just right where you are. You see, his call is three parts. I've already said it once, so I'm going to say it again. There are three parts. We must follow him. So we can become like him. So we can do what? His work. Not ours. And to do his work, we must first become like him. Before we can become like him, we've got to get to know him. And that's his call. Follow me. The third part of your notes, the men left their job. All of them left their job. Circle the word left. Well, that's the one that's underlined too. Circle it. They were responsive. They responded immediately. There wasn't a delay. See, when God calls us, and he does call us, it demands an immediate response, not a delayed response, not a defer. Well, I'll think about it. That's a good proposal, but I'll think about it. I'm not ready to buy today. See, a deferred decision is a no decision. It's not a deferred decision. It's a no the Bible even has stories of men that were also called that said no or had something else going on. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Luke. Luke chapter 9. If you don't, just listen to the story. Luke chapter 9 and verse 59 through the end of the chapter. Jesus calls two other men, but they have excuses. There's something else going on, something else in their lives that they just can't put aside or put away. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. Then he said to another, Jesus said to another, follow me. The same call. Follow me. It was nothing different. It just says, follow me. The same call. But he said, but the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Well, at first that sounds okay, I guess. But look at what Jesus says in verse 60. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you. I will. I want to. I'm going to. But, killer, let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Okay, we would think that's okay. Verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, I know these words may sound harsh, but Jesus doesn't mess around. He doesn't have time. He doesn't leave room for negotiation. He doesn't leave room for misunderstanding. He is very clear. We can't say, well, I don't think that's what he meant. There is no room for that. He is very clear. We have to know who's calling first. Well, that seems odd. This is the God that created you, that created the world, that created everything, and he's saying, I should be the most important thing in the world. The first man in 59 and 60, the first man had divided attention. God called him. God's call came to him, but he hesitated. He said, I needed to go bury my father. Now, we don't know what that means. We don't know 
his father was dead and they were waiting on the funeral. We don't know if he was about to die. We don't know if his father was just 40 and he was just saying, you know, one day when my dad dies, then I'll go. We don't know. He's just saying, I've got to do this other thing first. I've got to wait on this to happen. We don't know exactly. But the man's problem was his divided attention. That's it. His attention was divided. He felt God's call. He looked at the situation. He didn't yield. Same thing happens to us. So much our circumstances, our problems overwhelmed us. They overwhelmed him. Our problems, this thing that i got to take care of. He wanted to wait and handle it first. I've got to get this straight. And as soon as this problem is handled, then I will leave and follow you, Jesus. I'll be there. I promise. I will. But i got to go bury my father take care of my family, whatever it is. But Jesus demanded that the man act now. He saw through his partial commitment. He saw through it. Just like the rich young ruler, he says, what, what am I missing? He says, go sell everything. Jesus looks through all of it. We'll get right to the heart. He says, let the dead bury the dead. Jesus said, follow me. I didn't say, go take care of everything else. I said, follow me. He saw through the man's lack of trust. Jesus expects us to take care of our parents. That's not what the, the, the story is saying. He's not saying disregard your parents. He's saying love Christ even more than them. Top priority. Top priority. He demanded them. He, de he had a sense of urgency. He says not tomorrow, but today. Not after but now, he didn't even give him time. Let's say he was about to die. He didn't even give him time to go bury his father. <coughs> because people are dying out there every day without Christ, he says. We cannot do nothing for them. But the ones that are dying, we still can. It's a sense of urgency. In the 30 minutes I've been talking, cars have been passing us by. Not in church. Not hearing the word of God. Lost. No hope. There's one right there. You see the urgency. That's Jesus' urgency. They're all around us. Why are we waiting? We can't have the divided attention. He even tells the man to go preach. He even tells him what to preach. He says, go preach the gospel. Go preach God. In verse 60, he's telling him, son, I want you to go preach for me. <coughs> How much does Jesus tell us to go preach? How much does the Bible tell us we need to tell others and how little we do? <coughs> Jesus says, this is important. Not all the stuff at your house. Moving on, the second part is the second man. Verse 61 and 62. This man said, I'll follow you. I will. Kind of like the parables that the kid said, I'll mow the yard, Dad, and then he never did. That's the same guy. I will follow you. Something that Jesus said or did probably touched his heart. He probably saw Jesus working. He probably saw someone healed. And he says, I want to be that. I want to follow you, Jesus. I like that. I want to be a part of that team. But, I gotta go take some care of some stuff at the house. He was willing, but his allegiance was torn. Just like us. Something else had to be handled back at his house. Some family affair, a business affair, an employment affair, a financial affair, whatever it was, some concern. As in the case of so many of us, something else was waiting. Something else was concerning him. Maybe he wanted to just know what his family thought about his decision to follow Christ. Maybe he wanted to run it by them to see if they thought he was crazy for following Christ. Or maybe they wanted to see if it was okay, how they felt about his decision. Or maybe he had to get their approval. Whatever it was, he was putting his love for his family above Christ. And Christ says, I want to. Ten Commandments say, have no other gods before me. 
But we do, we put everything else. Jesus is to be first in our lives. And now his judgment on the man, he states it in such a way that if you ever read it or ever heard it, you will soon not forget. He says, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And I'm sure this man had never forgot it since he heard it from Jesus' mouth. See, if we're trying to plow and we look back, we plow crooked rows. You can't plow straight if you're looking back. We plow inconsistent fields, the fields that never always going and taking care of something else. It never receives the constant work. We uh, lack the spiritual commitment because we can turn away at any time because we have something else to do. We allow distractions and disruptions which affect the crops. He's saying if you plow, you can't look back but take care of what you're supposed to do, what I'm asking you to do. This call of Christ is critical and it demands a decision. And we are to respond immediately. My question to you this morning is, what things have you distracted? What would you tell Jesus if he came to you today and said, follow me? Well, I gotta. I will, but I gotta. What would you tell him this morning? <coughs> He's asking. I'm not asking. He's asking. What would you say? What immediate thing? I promise your immediate list will never end. Like when Lacey and I just got married. We were talking about having kids. Someone said, if you wait till you can afford to have kids, you'll never have them. Right? Still can't afford them. <laughs> I got two of them. The same thing with following Christ. If you're going to wait until you can afford to follow him, you never will. If you're going to wait until you get all your other stuff cleared up, guess what? You never will. He didn't say go home fix all your stuff, and then come on board. He said, come on board right now, just like you are. The last part of our notes, it says, the men followed him. Write that in. Follow, circle it. They got up and left. Thank God that these men, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, did get up. They did respond, and they did follow Christ. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not be sitting here. Do you understand that? These men were obedient and has led the Christian kingdom to expand all of these years because they were faithful. What is waiting on you? They did. What would happen if we did? I do believe we are all called by Christ. We are all called to follow him. We are all called to salvation. We are all called to minister in his name. We are all called to trust him with our salvation. We are all called to place our faith in him. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, there's one right there. Trust him. Place your faith in him, even when you don't understand it. That's one call. We all have. No denying. He calls us to keep our jobs and follow him. Change who you work for. And if God tells you to quit your job and sell everything and move to South America, you better do it. Don't let me stand in your way. Some he does. Some he does not. But he calls all of us to follow him and to further his kingdom. No matter who you are, God's call involves a drastic change. A drastic change. We cannot stay who we were. We cannot stay who we are and follow Christ. We have to change. My question is, do you accept this call this morning? His call never stops. His call has not ended. It's still here this morning. 